people who are practicing Christians, Catholics in particular, us, you go to Mass every Sunday, maybe you even go to daily Mass, right? And you hear the Gospel stories, you hear the readings from the Bible, and you know them, but I have news for you. You know them too well, because I do too, right? We think we know the story, we know the punchline. I did this to the group yesterday, right? If you hear, a father had two sons, you go, aha, it's the parable of the prodigal son, right? Except what if I was actually reading from the Gospel of Matthew? The prodigal son only appears in Luke's Gospel. Matthew's Gospel has another parable where Jesus begins the exact same way. A father has two sons, and to the sons he said, go out into the field to work. And the first son said, yes, father, but then goes off and watches a movie. And the second son says, no way, over my dead body, but then goes back and works in the field. We have to be attentive, pay attention, because if we know the story, we know the punchline, then we circumvent God, we cut God off. The Spirit continues to speak to us, but we preempt that if we know it too well. And the same thing is true here with, you know, what often appears in the second readings at Mass, right? The letter, in this case, to the Ephesians. It'll be familiar to you. Paul writes, blessed, uh, that should be B, that's a typo. Blessed by the God. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavens. That's another time. Oh, this is embarrassing. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know. That's PowerPoint. As he chose us, just as he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless before him in love. I just want to pause there for a minute. We get again a re- Iteration and echo, the same theme that's carried, that's carried through the New Testament over and over again. God has chosen us, the created, the creatures that God is bringing into existence before the foundation of the world, before creation itself, to be holy and blameless. God desires for us to be, in kind of fancy theological language, glorified, right? There's something that God has intended from the moment of creation that has to do with what's going to happen way later on. And I'll come back to that in a minute, too. But notice here, when we're talking about Christ's role in creation, the Word's role in creation, He goes on, He destined us for adoption as His children through Christ Jesus. Now, already we've got a couple different motives for the Incarnation, and sin hasn't even shown up yet. It was God's plan from before the foundation of the world that we be holy and blameless, that we be glorified, and we do so in Christ. And then the other reason is, God wanted us to be adopted children, and the plan was also through Christ. Well, wait a minute. Adam and Eve aren't even on the scene yet. No one's eating any apples. No snakes are talking to us. I'm not even wearing a fig leaf. <laughs> he destined us for adoption as his children through Christ Jesus. Such was his will and pleasure. <clears throat> to the praise his, of his glorious grace that he freely bestowed on us in the beloved that is Christ. Now here's where sin appears. But how does it appear? In him we have redemption through his blood. The forgiveness of our trespasses, which we need. We've messed up. We are in need of forgiveness, right? The forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace that he lavished on us. Now that's it. That's the only reference here. And it does what? Paul here is acknowledging that we are in need of reconciliation, of forgiveness. But notice how that comes way after all this other business about the role of Christ in creation, God's plan, the place of the word, right? Then he picks back up. With all wisdom and insight, he has made known to us the mystery of his will. In other words, Paul saying, hello, are you listening? Christ showed us, told us, gave us the example, has revealed to us God's plan. Let me remind you, according to his good pleasure, he set forth in Christ, what? As a plan for the fullness of time to gather up all things, things in heaven and things on earth. That's the real kicker for me. It says that if we listen to Jesus, if we pay attention to the Gospels, we see revealed to us God's will and pleasure, God's plan. And it was this, that in Christ, the reason Christ was set forth was to gather all of creation, all women and men, all the created order, everything, things in heaven, things on earth, everything. Everything that God lovingly brings into existence, God wants to bring back to God's self. And who's going to do that? Christ. Before the foundation of the world. Well, before we get here, let me just say something here. That in addition to my, my plea that we pay more attention to Scripture, that we pay closer attention and listen, 
for how the Spirit's speaking to us and to see what's actually written in the text. Typos notwithstanding. <laughs> yeah. I also think that you know, we need to be very mindful of the fact that there's a different logic at play here. Paul, at every turn, but most especially in, in the first letter to the Corinthians, he begins this letter this way, which is so fitting for us. He says there are two kinds of wisdom. There's worldly wisdom, human wisdom, and then there's the wisdom of God. And the wisdom of God seems like foolishness. It's nonsense. It's absurd to those who subscribe to the logic and wisdom of the world. You know, everything Jesus says is crazy. That was something Sister Kathy talked about last night, right? It's true. It's crazy. Forgive your enemies. Let people go. You know, love one another. Care. You know, put others before yourself. That's not a message we hear a whole lot about in 2017 USA. Same thing is true here. We are so sin-centered, so focused on the fallings and failings of others, that we who are created, as the scriptures tell us, in the image and likeness of God, spend so much of our time and energy trying to create God in our image and likeness. We assume God thinks the same way we do. And Paul says, forget about it. Wake up. Stop thinking that way. Irenaeus of Lyon, he got it. He figured it out. About a century later, he, he was writing about, you know, in contrast to these uh, kind of Greek thinkers, this sense of uh, this really Greek philosophically rooted understanding of Christianity called Gnosticism. It's really, in a sense, a heresy. The Gnostics, among other things, said that the created world materiality, you know, creation, our bodiliness, these are all bad things, that what's really important is our spirit or our soul, and that we're kind of like trapped here in this world, and we're kind of hanging out, but what we really got to focus on is, you know, <coughs> zipping up to heaven, right? Well, Irenaeus is like, no, I don't know what Bible you guys are reading. <laughs> Last time I checked, the word became flesh and moved in next door, and that word flesh in Greek is sarx, and it's not just human or human soul or human spirit, but sarx is the same kind of creatureliness, materiality that everything's made out of, whether you're a hippopotamus or a human or a worm or a tree. That's sarx, and that's what the word became. So he defends the incarnation, and he defends the goodness of the world, and he says, God created these things good. Remember Genesis 1, 31? Very good, in fact. He also held, and he gets this from St. Paul. He's not making this stuff up. He's getting it from sacred scripture. He reiterates the fact that creation and salvation are one action of God, one sign of the divine will. See, we, we get so used to thinking about them as separate, and we conflate salvation with redemption, right? Do you use those interchangeably sometimes? You hear it in that question, people ask one another, are you saved? <laughs> Which begs a further question, right? From what? It's the wrong question. It's the wrong line of questioning. Salvation isn't really about, in the first instance, our need for reconciliation with God. That's called redemption or reconciliation. Salvation, as St. Paul and then Irenaeus makes even clearer, is about this plan God has from the, from the beginning to bring everything back to God's self. And that's why creation and salvation are two sides of the same coin. St. Paul uses this word and uses it in Greek, recapitulation, right? Recap. God's plan from all time was to recap creation. And Irenaeus explains this this way. I think it's so beautiful. Irenaeus says that God, when God creates the Holy Trinity, it's like God the Creator, God the Father, has two hands. One hand is the Word, right? Christ. The other hand is the Spirit. And this is how God gets outside of God's self. And as God gets outside of God's self, God creates, brings into existence, loving existence, the whole universe, all of us, even the worms, right? Everything. But Irenaeus doesn't stop there. He says it's still one act. Outside of God's self, creation comes, right? But God also, through the Spirit and through the Word, through the Holy Spirit, through Christ, brings all of creation back to God's self. That image, which I love so much, that he talks about with hands, is really like a cosmic hug. That we come from God and come back to God. And that coming back to God is what we mean when we say salvation. 
Christ is the head of all creation, he says, at various points. He's, he's not at all convinced that sin, in the narrow sense, is the reason. He points again to St. Paul over and over again. He's got this famous line, too, which is really apt. In God's immeasurable love, he became what we are to make us what he is. Remember when St. Paul was writing in the letter to the Ephesians and in the letter to the Colossians, he was talking about that glorification, that, that fullness that God had planned for us from the beginning of time. This is what Irenaeus is pointing out. Why did God become human? Well, in the first instance, to bring us all back to God. It was part of God's plan from the beginning. Now, when we separate cause and effects, right? Separate our need for redemption from this need for glorification or salvation. We realize that even if human beings had not sinned, we may never need that redemption. But it was always God's plan to enter creation as part of creation for the purpose of that salvation, bringing all creation back to God's self. So we can say incarnation anyway, right? Everybody following me so far? All right, I know. It's after lunch and it's hot and it's Marty Hoggin singing. So. <laughs> Lots going on in here. So let's take a look at the guy who made my outfit very popular. I guess, I don't know, I don't know. A lot of people are down the hall wearing outfits very similar to this. I don't know if they point to St. Francis either, that Renaissance Fair or whatever's going on. Um, did I, tell, I told some of the folks yesterday, those who were at the workshop uh, on Franciscan prayer, about how I got off the elevator yesterday afternoon, and I showed up, and they have, uh, they're on the other side, this, this gathering, and there's a check-in table there, and I started walking by them, and I heard one of the women who was organizing it turn to some guy that was at the table and said, oh, he could be with us, or he could be with them. <laughs> closer, because I thought that was the check-in table. I am. <laughs> My first time at the Diocese of Reno annual uh, conference, so I don't know. Maybe you guys dress up like the Renaissance. I, I can't judge. Look at how I'm dressed. So I got closer, and then she said, oh no, he's the real thing. <laughs> so, she said, you want to go down the hall. <laughs> so Francis of Assisi, he was a very complex thinker. We, we oftentimes uh, reduce him to a caricature, right? I call it, and I've called it in the past, the birdbath industrial complex, <laughs> where we, like, we reduce Francis of Assisi to this cute little guy who loved the deer and wolves, and you know, and that was about it, right? But in truth, he was, he was, he was a real mystic. And people who experience God in such intimate and clear ways uh, oftentimes have a lot of insight to share with us. He wasn't a fancy theologian. He wasn't somebody who was educated at the great universities like Paris, like many other Franciscans in the generations that followed. He was somebody who was so deeply rooted in scripture and in living the gospel that he just got it, right? That's why he's so inspirational 800 years later, why people like me, for some reason, are dressed like him, right? In, in, continue to live after his example. It's the reason why the Bishop of Rome has taken the name Francis. You know, I think Pope Francis, it takes a Jesuit to show Franciscans how to be. I mean, I'll tell you that. But, you know, one of the things that's always captured my attention is, you know, how he has captured the attention of the entire world. He's oftentimes not doing, you know, amazing things. He's not solving, you know, great mathematical problems. He's not, like, doing Einstein stuff. He's not necessarily, you know, uh, ending wars or anything, although that would be wonderful, and he's certainly working toward that and encouraging us to, but oftentimes it's the little things. The fact that he has his birthday dinner with eight homeless people. The fact that he goes and visits the imprisoned or that he calls up single mothers on the phone. And people are like... Pfft. And it's just simplicity, but the simplicity is rooted in and born out of gospel living. It takes seriously that call that we receive at baptism to follow the example of Jesus Christ. And when people do that, it draws the attention of everybody. That's why Francis of Assisi became so popular, much against his own intention. Christ was so important to him, it goes without saying. He had a vision of the incarnation, you know, and, and, and his vision, his understanding of the role of Christ and how we should understand the incarnation and everything was really two poles, two bookends. And he was, it was a both and for him. Sometimes we live in a reality where we want to polarize everything. It's either or. 
But as Catholic Christians, we're big time both and people. Jesus' glory and majesty was on the one hand something he focused on, and on the other hand, it was God's free choice to live a life of human poverty that so fascinated Francis. His first biographer said, indeed, so thoroughly did the humility of the incarnation on the one hand and the charity of the passion on the other occupy his memory that Francis of Assisi scarcely wanted to think of anything else. Just like all of you, after this session, you're going to be so inspired, you're scarcely going to want to think of anything else. <laughs> He's so enamored with God's love in the incarnation that it affected his whole outlook, his whole spirituality. It changed, you know, certainly it's changed the history of, of Christianity and other traditions, you know, 800 years in the making. A lot of people know about Francis of Assisi and the Christmas Mass at Breccio, right? That's kind of birth of the nativity scene. But uh, the friars who lived with him, who knew him from the beginning, they started getting older and dying off about, you know, two or three decades after Francis died in 1226. And there was this very wise decision of some of the early Franciscan leaders to go around and interview and collect the stories of those friars who were with him. And they were oftentimes identified in the first person as we who were with him. And there's a collection called the Assisi Compilation, that's what AC is, of all of these stories, these remembrances. It's such a treasure. A lot of people have never even heard of this, right? Well, I encourage you to check it out. One of the stories is this with, with regard to Christmas. For Blessed Francis held the Nativity of the Lord in greater reverence than any other of the Lord's solemnities. So it wasn't just, oh, isn't that cute? He's got a little nativity scene and some donkeys and stuff. Christmas was the most important solemnity. That's, that's, that's kind of a big claim. That's a big statement to make, especially when we think about the resurrection and Easter, right? Why, though? Well, for although the Lord may have accomplished our salvation in his other solemnities, and here we get into that slippage again, right? That early friar is kind of using salvation where he really needs redemption in this case. Nevertheless, once Christ was born to us, as Blessed Francis would say, it was certain that we would be saved. We would be reconciled. We would be made right with God. That's why it's so important. And then they go on, and I love this little line. On Christmas Day, Francis wanted every Christian to rejoice in the Lord and for love of him who gave himself to us, wished everyone to be cheerfully generous not only to the poor, but also to the animals and birds. As I like to say, even the pets got a Christmas stocking that day. <laughs> It's, it's striking, you know. Pope Francis has written about this too, in the joy of the gospel in particular. He's mentioned this in his homilies. You may have heard of this before, where he, he's trying to wake us up in a way that I think Francis of Assisi did too, his own namesake. That there are too many Christians who go around living in Good Friday like there's no Easter, right? You've heard that before. Good Friday Christians that live without the resurrection. I think we put too much emphasis sometimes, and when we have a sin-centered mindset, that that's the most important thing, well, that's what we end up with. When we start thinking about other reasons for the Incarnation, well, it shifts our focus in so many different ways. We'll get to that in a minute. After Francis' death, there are other Franciscan thinkers who arise in the generations that follow uh, that help to think this through a little bit more clearly. People like Alexander of Hales, He's got a pretty cool beard. Uh, or Bobby Fathead, you may recall from the earlier <laughs> slide. That's what he looked like, I guess. And then my favorite, John Duns Scotus, the original dunce, as it were. John Duns Scotus, best known perhaps for being the architect of the dogma of the Immaculate Conception. It was him, he was the one in the late 13th, very early 14th century who kind of laid out the philosophical argument for it. John Duns Scotus is a big contributor. Sometimes people call this supralapsarian Christology the Franciscan thesis, or Franciscan interpretation or Christology. And that's partially true, but we can't take full credit for it. Though there are some major contributions, Scotus is one of them. He borrows from and builds on his predecessors, the things we've been talking about. He says, sin cannot be the reason or the cause for the highest good. It's absurd. It doesn't make any sense. And that's with all due respect to St. Augustine, right? Those of you, if any of you are deacons too, especially, you know the exalted at Easter, right? The Easter vigil. You get that horrible line, oh, happy fault. 
<laughs> there's this praise nestled right there in the retelling of salvation history about how good it is that Adam and Eve sinned. Praising sin. I think it's, it's, it's not cool, <laughs> to say the least. Uh, it's really something I think that needs to be reconsidered, whether it needs to be in there. Again, in the kind of box like Anselm or Augustine, you know, there's a logic to it where if sin is the reason for the Incarnation, then we have to celebrate it. That's pretty messed up, though, when you think about it. Anyways. Scotus says, along with so many others we've looked at in passing, including St. Paul, sin cannot be the cause of the highest good. And he separates redemption from glorification. He makes that distinction. He says, we, because we sinned, not only are we in need of glorification, which was God's plan from the beginning, but we also have to get right with God. So we need redemption. We need both of these. But if we hadn't sinned, we wouldn't need redemption, but Christ still would become human because we need that glorification. God's plan to be complete. Now, Scotus makes an interesting contribution and changes the conversation for a couple hundred years. He says, whereas all the other guys who came before him, all the men and women who had been thinking about this question and talking about this minority tradition and going back to St. Paul and looking at all the texts, They've been asking a hypothetical question. What if? What if Adam and Eve hadn't sinned? What if we didn't need redemption or reconciliation? And Scotus says, forget about the hypothetical. Let's just talk about reality as it is. What he calls the absolute present order. He says, we don't need to worry about this. We have enough evidence in sacred scripture. We know enough to say that. We don't even have to couch it in this hypothetical. He says that Christ is not an afterthought of God. God, Christ is not the plan B. So let's fast forward to the modern era. Everybody with me so far? All right, you guys are good. Yes? One well, question and observation that you are talking about the nativity yes, yeah. being the cornerstone of the faith, uh, according to Francis. Yeah. And then all of our churches are the cross on. Yeah. And so it looks like the church actually went the other way, and and even we even have the body on the cross of the crucifix. Yeah. And so should we be looking to take those down? Re <laughs> re 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 <laughs> no. We'll come back to that. Save that. Remind me. I want to make sure I get through this, but okay. we'll have time for some discussion. We'll start with that. Okay. So remind me of that. That might be a very big uh, differentiation between the Protestantism. Taking the well, off the cross and, you know, yes and no, yeah, mostly no, but uh, we'll, we'll come back to that, okay? <coughs> let's, let's, we're almost, we're almost at that point, but I want to just give you an, an extended list. These are folks in the last 100 or so, 150 years, who've, who've been so significant in thinking this way and expressing this understanding. People like, you know, Schleiermacher, a Protestant theologian, Karl Rahner, I mentioned him already, Wolfhard Pannenberg, a Lutheran theologian, uh, Karl Barth, the big giant of the 20th century, along with people like Rahner, and along with people like Von Balthasar, Thomas Merton. How many people know Thomas Merton? All right, good. Those of you who didn't raise your hands, you have a homework assignment. <laughs> <laughs> um, Sister Elizabeth Johnson, a renowned professor at, at Fordham University. Um, these are all theologians and thinkers, among many, many others, who have been writing about and thinking about and reflecting on this question, why did God become human, or what is the reason for the season, and the answer not starting with sin. I want to say something about Thomas Merton. I'm going to plug one of my books. There you go. You can plug it. There's your homework assignment. <laughs> Thomas Merton was very influenced by the Franciscan tradition. Uh, Scotus in particular, uh, but also St. Bonaventure, St. Francis of Assisi himself, and we can talk about uh, at another time how that was the case. At this point, I'd really just like to take a look at one of his writings. This, is, this comes from New Seeds of Contemplation. Has anyone read that? It's a few people. I, I highly recommend it. It's such a great book. It's, it's, it's so powerful. The last chapter is called The General Dance. And in it, he's talking about the incarnation. He's talking about God's entering into creation as part of creation. And he deals with this question, why? Why did God do this? And he proposes, I think in such beautiful ways, a response that's not sin-based. He says, the Lord made the world and made men and women. Now, interesting. Think about this. So, so Irenaeus and Leon of Adam. God created. He starts with creation. Why did God even create? 
Do we ever ask ourselves that? We know that God is the maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible, but do we ever ask why? Yeah, yeah, maybe. This is exactly right, you know? God, it sounds silly, right? But that's because we operate according to the logic of the world. God made the world, made us, in fact, in order that he himself might descend into the world, that he himself might become a human being. The world was made as a temple, as a paradise, into which God himself would descend to dwell familiarly with the spirits he had placed there to tend it for him. The whole reason that God created was to enter the world to be a part of it. That's very different from what we usually think of, right? God creates kind of outside of God's self, and kind of, it's usually this watchmaker God. God creates, and that's one thing, do, 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 and God's like, all right, well, it's time to catch the flight to Aruba, and then my God goes and gets into the God plane. This is, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> like, God plane? Which letter to the what was that? God skips off, right, and lets things unfold, and then we mess up, and right as God's leaving, he's like, oh, plan B, better send the word, right? I mean, it sounds silly, but that's typically the way a lot of people think through this, right? Merton says, no, 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 no. Think back to what Paul was writing about in the Ephesians. From, the, from before the foundations of the world, from all eternity, when God was planning to create, it was part of God's plan. In fact, God... The only reason God created was to enter into it, to be near to us. And we see that all throughout Scripture. Those of you who were in the workshop yesterday afternoon, I went through that. Remember? Genesis 1, Genesis 2, Genesis 3, Genesis 4. Just kidding. I only did two chapters, and then we moved around. But we see it everywhere. Relationship. For Merton, incarnation, the word becoming flesh, was always part of God's plan. And the reason I'm highlighting Merton, that in addition to the fact I think he's awesome, and B, Pope Francis thinks he's awesome. Remember when Pope Francis visited the U.S. last year, well, year or now, two years ago? I mentioned Thomas Merton and Dorothy Day along with Martin Luther King and Abraham Lincoln to Congress. He's insightful, but he's also, he, he writes about these things in such, uh, you know, approachable and accessible ways. For Merton, the starting point is in no way related to sin doesn't mean he doesn't take sin seriously, like Scotus, like Irenaeus, like others. Sin is a reality, and we need to get right with God. We need redemption, but that's not God's starting point. He says further, same chapter, the Lord would not only love his creation as Father, but he would enter into his creation emptying himself, hiding himself, as if he were not God, but a creature. He's just echoing the letters of the Philippians, right? Though he was in the form of God, he didn't deem equality with God something to be grasped. Rather, he emptied himself, taking on the form of a slave, becoming like us in human appearance and human form, entering our messy reality. Merton asks, why the heck would God do this? To which he responds, because God loved his creatures and because God could not bear could not stand that his creature should merely adore him as distant or remote, transcendent, and all-powerful. It's a very different starting point for thinking about the reason for the season. And we can start singing Christmas hymns now. <laughs> Love is the starting point. The way that Merton says this so poetically, it's, I, I think it's true. I mean, it's, it's a, a, a more, I, I shouldn't say more beautiful description. That's not fair. It's not right. But it's a beautiful way of re-articulating what we were already looking at in St. Paul, right? It's what we hear in John's Gospel. How many football games do you watch where everybody's got the poster board? John 3.16! Woo! <laughs> yeah, John 3.16. God so loved the world. We rush into all this. Look at your own sign, people, right? Love is the reason. God could not stand it, Merton says. He could not bear that we would just know God as some kind of like absentee landlord. So it was God's plan from the beginning to enter into relationship with us. So what? <laughs> I hope you already have your wheels turning, that, this, this, that it's new to you, that it might allow you to think about things maybe a little differently, and if it's not new to you, that it's a refresher to think about things aright. 
But I think there are some takeaways. I'm going to offer three because a lot of us here are ministers. A lot of us here are engaged in active involvement in our parishes and the like. And say that the first kind of takeaway I might suggest, and there are others, is it affects our preaching and teaching to think like super lapsarians, right? To understand that reason for the starting point for the incarnation. Preaching not just if you're a priest like me or a deacon or somebody who's giving reflections at mass or in other liturgies. Preaching as the, the pseudo-Franciscan expression goes, right? Francis of Assisi is attributed as saying, preach the gospel at all times and if... Necessary yeah, sometimes these were necessary words. I hate to be uh, Franciscan Mythbusters here, but Francis never said that. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know, I know, I know. I know. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Sorry. 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 Sorry.